Tonight we are in the middle of the Labor Day weekend. But Monday will be a working holiday for Vice President Kamala Harris, who returns to the campaign trail with stops in Michigan and Pennsylvania, where she will appear alongside President Joe Biden. The polls show VP Harris and former President Donald Trump headed into the fall locked in a tight race. A critical debate looms next week. While the first ballots of the 2024 campaign go out in just a matter of days. We have all the election latest ahead on Politics Nation. Plus, we're following breaking news out of the Middle East. Vice President Harris and President Biden have spoken with the family of Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg Poland. One of the six hostages Israeli forces found dead in Gaza on Saturday. We'll have the latest on demonstrations breaking out throughout Israel. We begin with NBC's Matt Bradley in Tel Aviv. Matt, what are you hearing from protesters there? Yeah, Reverend, I was out there for a couple of hours with my team, and, you know, one of the things that came out loud and clear is that these protesters, yes, they're blaming Hamas for the death of these six young people, but they're also blaming Benjamin Netanyahu, their prime minister. And this is something that we've been hearing from this same group of protesters for months now. Uh, but this wasn't the, really the same group. This was much, much larger. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. And again, this is a weekly protest, but it took the deaths of these six people to bring out these huge numbers and really heap the pressure on the prime minister. Now, what they're demanding is that the prime minister compromise and move his position on these negotiated settlement, kind of bringing a modicum of peace, a measure of peace to the Gaza Strip, while also freeing those remaining hostages. So far, the prime minister hasn't budged, and these protesters are blaming him. They're saying that he's putting, and a lot of the Israeli media is saying that he's been putting roadblocks ahead of a negotiated deal. What we've seen most recently is the prime minister's insistence that Israeli troops remain along the Philadelphia corridor, which is just another word for the border between the southern part of the Gaza Strip and Egypt's Sinai Peninsula. It's simply that border area. Now, they took that over, the Israelis, back in May, and now it looks like Benjamin Netanyahu has added that in to the negotiations, saying that he wants those troops to remain. This was very, very difficult for the Egyptians, and it's almost a non-starter when it comes to Hamas, and Hamas has routinely accused Netanyahu of deliberately trying to scuttle the deal. But, you know, there are a lot of Israelis, and a lot of Israelis who were out there tonight who were saying the exact same thing about their prime minister. I spoke with one young man. He's a joint, he's a British-Israeli citizen. His name is Tom. Here's what he had to say about the prime minister. It's clear that it's not working. It's clear that what they're trying isn't exactly fully working in terms of getting rid of Hamas. And it's clear that to save our own citizens and to save our people, we need to get a deal across the line. And with that, we can get to a more di diplomatic solution that will save more lives than it will hurt. Right now, all it's doing is hurting lives. So what Netanyahu has been saying is that only military pressure and military operations will free those remaining hostages. These protesters are saying only a negotiated deal will do that. And they say that the murder of these six young people vindicates their position. Reverend? All right, Matt Bradley, thank you for giving us your report. Joining me now is Governor Michelle Lewan Grissom a Democrat from New Mexico. Governor, we've had a lot to cover uh, tonight, but I, I want to quickly get your thoughts on the death uh, of the deaths of the six hostages. Both President Biden and Vice President Harris have reached out to the family of the uh, Hesh Goldberg Pollen. Uh, his parents spoke at the Democratic Convention pleading for their son's release. Well, what are your thoughts tonight on this tragedy? 
Well, Reverend, thank you so much for having me on this afternoon. And let's start with my deepest sympathies and condolences to the Goldberg Poland family. Uh, it's unthinkable. Uh, and I also, my heart goes out uh, to uh, condolences to all the families, of course, but to all the other folks who are still waiting with the number of hostages that we have not been able to bring home. And I think that as you uh, saw an earlier report that uh, a growing number of individuals, not just in Israel, but in America and the Biden-Harris administration, leaning in hard. We need a ceasefire. We need lasting peace in the region. We need to work with all of the partners in the Middle East. That includes the Prime Minister. And that certainly I have confidence in the Biden-Harris administration. But it really points to we have to get a deal across the finish line. Thank you for that. Governor, let, let, let's turn to the campaign trail, where the vice president will be quite busy this Labor Day holiday. She'll be starting off in Detroit, then joining the current president in their first joint campaign event in Pittsburgh. Since accepting, this is the first appearance together since she accepted the party's nomination. Trying to appeal to voters in each of these uh, key swing states. What are you expecting to be the key messaging for the day and for the rally with President Biden? What specifically are you expecting to hear from him, President Biden, a native of Pennsylvania? Well, um, I think the nation and the voters in that state are uh, going to hear again very forceful, strong commitments with a track record to, to uh, back it up about working for the middle class, for uh, standing up for labor, recognizing that quality workforce depends on right the, the rights of work, everyday working Americans. They're going to talk about the fact that they're the only team that's reduced taxes. Uh, and uh, continuing to focus on the middle class, complete contrast to a Trump presidency and his campaign that is going to raise taxes on the middle class, class has no respect for workers and working Americans, and uh, is clear about just protecting the wealthiest Americans, and continues to frankly make it easier for jobs out of the country instead of really focusing on manufacturing and jobs right here at home, and again, who has a track record to show that that's occurring, this administration, and I'll tell you, in New Mexico, the first solar reshoring manufacturing plant in the United States is right here in New Mexico. The Inflation Reduction Act, those investments are going to do far more already have for increasing right, fair, productive labor investments in the middle class and real secure careers and jobs all across the country. Investment in the middle class and jobs major issues but another issue is going to be highlighted because starting tuesday democrats will kick off a bus tour focusing on reproductive rights it is set to get underway in trump's hometown of palm beach florida earlier this week the former president said he would vote against an abortion rights measure on the ballot in florida after facing significant backlash from conservatives for suggesting he might not approve of the state's abortion ban. Here's what Trump told Fox News on Friday. So I think six weeks, you need more time than six weeks. I've disagreed with that right from the early primaries. When I heard about it, I just disagreed with it. At the same time, the Democrats are radical because the nine months is just a ridiculous situation. So I'll be voting no for that reason. Now, Governor, we, we've also heard Trump claiming he wants to offer free IVF treatments to parents. Should Americans believe anything he has to say on these topics? After all, he is the president who appointed the judges in the Supreme Court who overturned Roe versus Wade. 
Right. Well, to answer your question just directly, absolutely not. You can't believe a thing he says. Uh, you can certainly look at his actions. He continues to boast uh, that he's responsible for overturning Roe v. Wade. Uh, he is the architect of Project 2025. He wants to ban abortion. Uh, he's the uh, candidate of convenience. He says whatever, whenever he thinks that he might be able to moderate his extreme MAGA base and other potential conservative Republicans. You cannot believe anything except this. He will, in fact, ban abortion. He will not do anything to protect IVF access. He isn't interested in the freedoms of your families or reproductive justice and access. He doesn't care about the Affordable Care Act. He's tried to repeal it. He has no plan. He boasts continually about trying to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. He doesn't believe in Medicaid. He doesn't believe in Medicare. And he fought against veteran administration health care protections for IVF for veterans members. He can never be taken at his word except know this. Follow his actions. He intends to ban abortion in this country and he will ban and interfere with all of your reproductive freedoms. He will punish women and continue to prosecute doctors. Now, now you are a border state governor, so I want to get your take on immigration. The vice president says she would sign the bipartisan border deal if elected, which Republicans in Congress killed at the request of former President Trump. Trump's plan seems to center around mass deportations. His supporters even held signs to that effect at the Republican convention. What are your thoughts about the contrast between the two candidates on this topic, you being the governor of a border state? Well, Reverend, I really appreciate you asking me the question, given that we are a border state. And it, the contrast could not be clearer or starker between these two candidates. One, we are a huge, in fact, the largest trading partner in Mexico, $79 billion. This notion that he wants to close the border, that he kills every immigration reform, that he's done nothing to actually do anything about security, because he hasn't added any staff or drones or measures or supported states in ways in which we can help pending the uh, immigration reform, because we know this is a federal issue. He just lies about the border. Two, lowest crossings ever. Uh, this is Biden-Harris because they actually are doing everything they can, given that without Congress, they have severe limitations here. He wants concentration caps, mass immigration, which means hospitality, agriculture, farming, ranching, long-term care, all of the things when we give people a pathway to citizenship means that. Uh, fairly means that we are having right the kind of economic development that frankly this country must have can't feed America or feed the world without this trading partner also this is the second time he's had an effective border deal that does border security, stops bad actors, holds them accountable, and creates the kind of support for free trade and allows us to invest in, right, South and Central America so that we're offering visas fairly on the front end, really solving these problems. 4,000 asylum officers so we can move these cases so that we meet our constitutional responsibility and the humanitarian work that this country's always been about and, in fact, is embedded in our Constitution. Proof positive by the Biden-Harris administration, Harris, only candidate ever for president that's prosecuted transnational gangs that understand being from California, what goes on at the border. One last time, you can believe nothing he says. He's going to continue to limit our ability to have a secure border, to have 1,500 new uh, border officers, and to support border states like mine. Thank you for being with us, Governor Michelle Lewan Grissom of New Mexico. Joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Jasmine Crockett, who represents Texas 30th District. Thank you for joining me today, uh, Congresswoman. Uh, first, let's continue the discussion on immigration. This week, your governor, Greg Abbott, said the border issue in Texas has been solved. 
which seems to contradict what Trump has been saying because he claims the border with Mexico is wide open. It also ignores the many problems Governor Abbott has created by busing migrants to large American cities where mayors say they are overwhelmed and by deploying the Texas Guard, 17 of which have died while deployed in the uh, past three years. And we learned in the Army uh, uh, Times, uh, the Army Times last week, uh, that some of the families have yet to receive compensation. Well, what is your assessment of what's going on right now on the border in Texas? Yeah, this is just kind of the Republicans doing what they do, taking credit for things that they've not done correctly. Listen, we know that border crossings are at a low. We know that they are actually lower than they were when Trump left office. And so what Governor Abbott wants to do is he wants to say, well, it's all because of me. I do want to be clear that these guys believe that the only way that you can, quote unquote, fix the border is by building a wall. And I appreciate how the governor laid out, number one, that every time you see a migrant going across the border, it doesn't mean that we have a security issue. There are two crises that we see at the border. One has to do with security because we obviously don't want the bad guys getting in. We don't want them to traffic guns. We don't want them to traffic drugs. We don't want them to traffic people. But at the same time, we know that there are people that have been in positions in which their own local areas have been destabilized. I specifically recall the Haitians, when the Haitians were trying to cross at the southern border, yeah. and it was Governor Abbott that ordered that those persons that were in the water be beat back while those officers were on horses. And at the time, no one asked the question of why are the Haitians coming? And that is why the work that Vice President Harris has done has been so important, because it's about finding out what are the root causes that are requiring people to say, you know what, I will take this dangerous trek so that I can try to get to a country, a country that used to be the land of opportunity and the land of the free, but seemingly wants to crap all over us. And so, listen, my governor has only wasted tax resources, has only caused people to lose their lives, and unfortunately has never fixed anything. But with the work that the Biden-Harris administration has done without the help of Congress, we have been able to get those numbers down. Mm -hmm. But this is not a permanent fix. We need actual legislation. And it was Trump and his cronies that killed the opportunity to do so. No, and the numbers are lower now than when Trump was president. Uh, but facts does not get in the way of a former President Trump. And I remember when uh, those uh, border uh, patrolmen were on horseback. I went down there, in fact, about that issue. But, you know, President Trump continues to defend his visit last week to Arlington National Cemetery. I want to bring that up to you. Uh, that's where he posed for pictures among uh, amid the graves of fallen soldiers and a member of his campaign reportedly tangled with an employee trying to enforce the cemetery rules. Now, you've spoken out about the lack of respect Trump showed in this incident, not only to the norms of the military, but to the rule of law. Can you elaborate on that tonight? Yeah, you know, I don't understand how this party gets to claim that they are the party of law and order when all we see is nothing but disorder and dysfunction coming out of them. Trump does not care about any rules, laws. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. And that is the scariest part about him trying to ascend to the presidency again, because we have a Supreme Court that is basically giving him carte blanche to do whatever he wants to do in their immunity decision. And while this immunity decision currently sits in place, we've not seen anything out of the ordinary come out of President Joe Biden. But we know that this decision was all about Trump and him being able to be the rogue actor that he is. He consistently disrespects women. We knew that before he got elected the first time. He then went and he was uh, found to be liable for disrespecting the norms and the rules around what it takes to get money from banks. Then he decided that he was going to disrespect the norms of the law, federal as well as state, when it came down to trying to ascend to the presidency with the cover-up that he perpetrated in New York. Then we know that once it came down to a peaceful transfer of power, he knows nothing mm -hmm. about peace. Instead, he basically was okay with these rogue folk deciding that they were going to go after and try to kill his vice president 
just so he could stay in office. People should be concerned. Forget the policy differences that the two parties may have, because we know that he doesn't have any policies that he's laid out specifically. These are people that are saying, well, we know what the Republicans used to stand for. Well, I'm telling you, this is the party of MAGA, and they don't stand for anything except for lawlessness. Law and order party who nominated a person convicted of 34 felonies. Let's switch gears to debate, to the debate that's coming up next week. Sources tell NBC News that Vice President Harris has been preparing to take the debate stage for months, beginning back when she was expecting to debate Trump's running mate, Senator J.D. Vance. You are co-chair to Harris's campaign. What's your advice for the vice president as she gears up for debate night? Yeah, so uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, we will see if he has the courage to show up. Um, but I think that what's most important is that um, she's going to do what she's been doing. She's been showing that she's strong and has a command of the issues. But here it is, again, this is a guy that does not deal in reality and the norms of what it means to run for president. And so she's had an opportunity to study him. And, and as she said many times, she knows his type. And so I think that if it calls for it, she needs to go ahead and tap back into her uh, prosecutor roots. Um, we know how to control witnesses as trial attorneys. And we also know when someone is being non-responsive, we know that he usually skips over answering questions that he just doesn't like, and he decides that he's going to talk about somebody else. I think it's going to be really important that she point those out, um, those instances out for the American people if for some reason the moderators do not do their jobs, which we saw last time, the moderators failed to control the candidates whatsoever. All right, and let me thank you, Congresswoman Crockett. You introduced me to your father in Chicago at the Democratic <laughs> Convention. I see where you get your fire from. Thank you for being with us tonight, uh, Congresswoman Crockett. Coming up. There were massive protests tonight in Israel after the bodies of six hostages were found yesterday in Gaza, including one Israeli-American. We'll have the latest headlines and analysis from my panel when Politics Nation comes right back. Welcome back to Politics Nation. Thousands of protesters are pouring into the streets of Israel tonight to express outrage and anguish after the bodies of six hostages were found dead in Gaza. We first reported on our show last night that the IDF had discovered the bodies, although we did not yet know the identities. Among the hostages killed is Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg of Poland. Uh, earlier today, both President Biden and Vice President Harris spoke with his parents, Rachel Goldberg and John Poland, to offer their condolences. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan will hold a virtual meeting today with the families of American hostages held by Hamas. Joining me now is in MSNBC political analyst Rick Tyler and Michael Hardaway, former staffer to Congressman Hakeem Jeffries and Senator Duke, Dick Durbin. Uh, Michael, Hirsch Goldberg, Poland's parents, spoke at the Democratic Convention last month pleading for the return of the hostages. In her keynote speech, Vice President Harris spoke of how she and President Biden have been working around the clock trying to bring them home. What are your thoughts on the tragedy and on the Biden administration's effort to try to free hostages uh, that are still being held captive and to also try to bring about a ceasefire. It's horrifying. It's something that no parent should have to do in terms of burying their child. The reality is that, you know, it, we're 10 months in and there has to be a ceasefire because there's been way too much death and destruction. And what we need now at this point is for Netanyahu to come to some sort of deal in partnership with the U.S and with Qatar um, to end this tragedy. I think that you have thousands of people marching in the streets today in Israel who want this to end, and the time has come. And so if I'm the U.S. president, whoever it is, I have to continue working in partnership with Egypt and with Qatar 
and with Israel to end this tragedy immediately. Now, Rick, you, you see it in the demonstrations tonight. There's a lot of anger towards Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over the hostage crisis, with some Israelis accusing him of torpedoing a ceasefire deal. Donald Trump, meanwhile, posted on his social media blaming Harris and Biden for the death of the hostages. What kind of political impact will this tragedy in Israel have in Israel and here at home that's facing an election? Obviously, it's, uh, it's very sad. Uh, but look, um, the protesters should be pro protesting Hamas. The United States should not be sitting down with Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization, uh, and at the minimum, this should be a hostage negotiation, not a peace or a ceasefire negotiation. Hamas could end this tomorrow if they would lay down their arms and release the hostages. They have not done that. And in fact, they decided to kill six hostages because the Israeli defense forces were closing in, uh, in on rescuing them. Um, and so it is tragic, but the, but the blame falls at the feet of Hamas, and the United States needs to keep uh, supporting our uh, ally and our democratic uh, friend in the Middle East, uh, Israel, uh, and do everything they can to get the hostages back. This is not Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu's fault. This is the fault of Hamas. It's, there's can be no question. But, but can't you defend Israel and stand for Israel and stand against what happened October 7th, which was deplorable by any standard, uh, but at the same time be vehemently opposed to Benjamin Netanyahu, who, who many Israelis, all polls say most Israelis, find great displeasure in. I understand the frustration and I understand the political implications of, of uh, Netanyahu's particular situation, uh, but it doesn't change the facts on the ground. The fact on the ground is October 7th, uh, Hamas took uh, more than 100 people captive, besides the 1,000 that they killed, and held those people uh, against international law and continued to hold them. Uh, and if they wanted to end or have a ceasefire, uh, they could lay down their arms and release the hostages because we don't, we don't take hostages in war times. Uh, that's not what civilized people do, and the United States should not be negotiating with people who are terrorists and not civilized. Uh, Netanyahu, in that regard, is correct. Hamas has to be defeated. They cannot be negotiated with. Otherwise, we repeat this cycle over and over again. The, no, I, 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 uh, I think no, people, there's no doubt that uh, uh, Hamas did October 7th, and there's no doubt that it was wrong, and there is no doubt there's concern uh, that you have over 35,000 people many of them civilian and children killed in Gaza. And I think those are the uh, things that uh, raise serious concerns to people on both sides of this argument. Switching gears, Michael, President Biden will be campaigning with Vice President Kamala Harris in Pennsylvania tomorrow, their first joint appearance since the convention. What role should the president be playing in the Harris campaign going forward? Well, President Biden is a son of Pennsylvania. He grew up in Scranton. And what he has to do is really drive energy and support behind her in this effort, in this appearance this week. You know, she's already incredibly popular across the country, but she is neck and neck with Trump in Pennsylvania. And what Joe Biden has to do is become Scranton Joe and really tell the story of how this administration has delivered for people in Pennsylvania in terms of the energy industry specifically in terms of the working class uh, benefits they provided, they have to tell those stories, and Joe is in the center of that. All right, Rick Tyler and Michael Hardaway, thank you both for being with us. Coming up, obesity is a major problem in the African-American community, and yet some of the most promising new treatments remain out of reach for many. It's time to fix this alarming gap in our health care system. That's next. My capacity as head of the National Action Network, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post calling attention to a glaring gap in our health care system. Obesity is a ballooning problem in our country, particularly for African Americans. Nearly half of black Americans, including 60% of black women, are obese. In recent years, a 
new generation of anti-obesity drugs have made weight loss easier. And yet these treatments remain out of the reach for many black Americans. Last year, African Americans received only about 12% of the prescriptions for one popular anti-obesity drug, while whites received 85%. A major part of the problem is that Medicare and some Medicaid programs do not cover anti-obesity medication. Critics will say the drugs are too expensive, but the price pales in comparison to the cost of doing nothing when half of all Americans are expected to be obese within five years. That's because obesity is an underlying condition that leads to other health-related issues, such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, and high blood pressure. The total cost for obesity and obesity-related diseases is projected to total $4 trillion over the next 10 years. It simply makes no sense to wait for chronic deadly diseases to emerge when there are treatment options to avoid them. As the old saying goes, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I've gone on my own weight loss journey, so I know the transformative impact a healthy lifestyle can have on the body and the mind. We should rise up and make sure the latest anti-obesity treatments are available to all Americans, especially black Americans, who have borne the weight of an inequitable health care system for far too long. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Politics Nation. The League of United Latin American Citizens is sounding the alarm in Texas after State Attorney General Ken Paxton conducted raids linked to a Democrat running for a Texas House seat. The AG's office says it carried out multiple search warrants as part of an investigation into election fraud and vote harvesting. Agents raided the home of Celia Castellano, who is running to represent Texas 80th State House District, even taking her phone as part of the alleged probe. The League of United Latin American Citizens isn't buying the Attorney General's claim. The organization's Texas State Director, Gabriel Rosales, said in a statement the raids were instigated to, quote, suppress the Latino vote through intimidation and any means necessary to try to tilt the electoral process in the favor of his political allies, end of quote. Joining me now is Juan Porano. He is the CEO of the League of United Latin American Citizens. Uh, Juan, what more can you tell us about the raids carried out by Ken Paxton? Why is your organization uh, making sure the country hears about this? Good evening, Reverend Sharpton. What well, we've learned is that there were at least 12 warrants issued uh, last week. Um, five of those, we've actually been able to speak with victims. Four of those are actually black members. It's a pattern uh, here for Attorney General Paxton. Back in June, he uh, sued the Archdiocese of Rio Grande Valley for its work with immigrants, the Annunciation House in July. Uh, in the last two weeks, 12 more Latino nonprofits, and then last week, Latino leaders, civic members, uh, and black members. Now, let, let's move to Capitol Hill, where Congress is already getting ready to pass a critical funding bill this month. Lawmakers are hoping to avoid a spending fight going into an election, but the conservative House Freedom Caucus is pushing to include language require, requiring stricter proof of citizenship, requirements for voting as a condition, for passing a continuing resolution to keep the government operating. Isn't this yet another voting intimidation effort coming from Republicans? It absolutely is. We already had a bipartisan immigration bill that was on the books. The Senate had actually already passed it, and then it was thwarted by Donald Trump and the Republicans in the House. And so, you know, LULAC has actually filed suit five times in the state of Texas, and in 2020, LULAC filed suit against Donald Trump specifically for this issue, and we were able to win that case. Now, let's talk about immigration policy more broadly. 
Vice President Harris has come out in favor of the bipartisan border bill, which Republicans in Congress killed at the request of former President Trump. Trump's own immigration policy, as he describes it at his rallies, calls for more border walls and mass deportation. When you speak with members of the Latino community, what do you hear about these two competing visions on immigration? Well, we understand that there needs to be common sense immigration reform. We understand that we need new legislation to help mitigate a lot of the issues that we've had. But we're also sensitive to the issues of immigration in the interior. There are, you know, millions of Latinos that have been here for 10, 20, 30 years who've established their homes, that have gotten married and have children. So we want a uh, immigration reform package that's sensitive to the issues at the border, but also takes care of immigrants that have been here for years and years. This year, Pew Research Projects, uh, a, a pre Pew Research uh, uh, Projects, they project that the eligible Latino voter population rose to 36.2 million in 2024. That's a 12 percent increase from 2020. In addition, while Latino voters have often favored Democratic candidates, the margins have grown closer in recent years. Pew found that 39% of Hispanic voters cast ballots for Republicans in the 2022 midterms, as opposed to 36% in 2020 presidential elections. Before I let you go tonight, what are your thoughts about the impact Latino voters can have in 2024, and how can both parties better reach out and understand these voters? Well, 50% of all the new voters from 2020 to 2024 are actually Latino. And so, you know, Latino vote doesn't matter only in states like Arizona, Nevada, and New Mexico, where they're a large part of the population, but also in states like Georgia. There are a million Latinos in the state of Georgia. The Latinos are 5% of the eligible vote in the state. And in the state that was won by less than 15,000 votes, the Latino vote is going to be even more critical, not just in Georgia, but in Pennsylvania and in Michigan and in Wisconsin as well. Now, I'm out of time, but I have to ask you this, Juan. What do you expect and project uh, the turnout will be and whether you are seeing enough efforts on both sides of this race uh, for turnout, particularly in the Latino communities and addressing their concerns because Latinos is a diverse kind of community within the Latino community and they have to be addressed differently uh, because they face different challenges in whatever state or region of the country they're in. I could not agree with you more, Reverend Sharpton. You know, for Latinos, um, you know, we're going to come out. Um, the enthusiasm gap or the unfavorability rating that Biden had has essentially been wiped out by Kamala Harris and Governor Walls. There's a lot more enthusiasm that we're seeing uh, for, for the Democratic Party, certainly. And we were all shocked when the Republican Party handed out fast deportation signs at their convention. Uh, that's just not something that we're going to go back to. You're talking about separating families, you're talking about mixed status households that would be impacted, and the impact they would also have on our economy would be absolutely devastating. Can you imagine one million Latinos disappearing from this economy in any state around the, around the country? It would have devastating consequences. And many, uh, uh, unlike what is projected in some uh, of the right, is that many of these that are being denied and targeted are citizens, many of them born in this country. We act as though uh, that everybody that's Latino uh, is, is someone that is not here uh, legally, which is not true. Many of them are American citizens, and many of them born here in America, in the United 76, States. 76 percent of the new eligible Latino voters are born in the United States. 24 of them are actually naturalized citizens. You know, the Republican Party has done a much better job of investing long-term in Latino vote through organizations like Libre, and our hope is that the Democratic Party, Democratic candidates will heed that and begin to invest an equal amount in ensuring that Latino voices are heard this election cycle. Juan Perano, I uh, thank you for being with us. Always good to talk with you. Thank you for being with us. Up next, my final thoughts. Stay with us.